This meeting is now being recorded. Well, good evening. Welcome to the EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker for this evening, we'd like to give an overview of our free program to those attending for the first time. So we'll go over who we are, uh, what is our program, some upcoming events, introduce our speaker this evening, Trish Megan, and then we'll have a Q&A. So again, um, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness Program based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, who's also on the call, leads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS Support Group. She was diagnosed with EDS in 2008, the same year my wife passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife, Carol, who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. So we introduced our program at the 2012 EDNF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've started over 95 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities but many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Series. We meet every first and third Tuesday, typically at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. All the programs are free. The meeting announcements and whenever possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our website at edsawareness.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requesting the free report on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. The store is the only funding for this program and usually covers our monthly web fees. Please visit our, visit our store and check out the helpful products that we sell. So just a general disclaimer, this presentation contains general information about EDS. Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in the program. The information is not advice, if you're having medical problems now, please call 911 and get the services that you need. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to your treatment. Our next webinar is going to be uh, Dr. Grubb, who many of you are familiar with. Um, he is a POTS expert in Toledo, Ohio, and he's going to do a presentation on POTS on February 16th. And here are more of our upcoming speakers. Please see the webinar page on our website at edsawareness.com for the full schedule. For those attending live, there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Add your questions at any time by clicking the Q&A icon at the top of your screen. After typing in your question, click the orange button to submit. Our speaker for tonight is Trish Megan. Her topic is related to physical therapy for Ehlers-Danlos. Trish practices at physical, physical therapy at Healy Physical Therapy in Cumberland, Rhode Island. She specializes in manual therapy and has experience treating EDS patients since 2011. And she's focused on EDS since 2013. She's a PT clinical education staff mentor as well as a clinical instructor for graduate students. In addition, Trish provides inpatient rehabilitation at the Southern New England Rehab Center at Our Lady of Fatima Hospital. She also teaches as an adjunct instructor at New England Institute of Technology in the Physical Therapy Assistant Program. She received her doctorate of physical therapy and undergraduate graduate degrees 
in athletic training and sports medicine from Quinnipiac University. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Trish, and um, I'm, we're going to be loading her slides. And thank you for joining us tonight, Trish. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the microphone to you now. Thank you both for having me. Thank you all for coming. Um, so tonight I wanted to uh, share with you a lecture that I was asked to give and uh, asked to share online. And it originally started with a great story, which we'll get to, but I just wanted to thank all of my patients who have been kind of the inspiration and mostly the information background for this lecture. Without them, it really wouldn't have come to fruition. So tonight I'm going to be speaking on um, physical therapy for EDS and specifically how posture and the thorax or rib cage will affect your PT program. Um, and at any point, if you have questions, type them in there, and I'll try and get to all of them at the end. Um, so like I said, that was the plan topic, and the first time I gave this lecture, it was also the plan topic, and there was one big problem with that. Um, the big problem with that is posture is very boring. Um, frankly, in general, posture is a very big topic to cover, and it's kind of a head-to-toe thing. You can't talk about posture without talking about everything. And it's very specific to each person, and it's not specific to EDS in general. So you would stop listening after five minutes. So I had to modify that a lot because I couldn't possibly talk about posture in EDS and physical therapy in a very general sense for that long because I would bore myself as well. So the focus for this presentation specifically is going to be an overview of posture and then also um, help with help from patients kind of decoding some different PT terms that – I educate patients on in the clinic quite often um, because there's a lot of misconceptions about what words to use and then there's a lot of confusion if you're using the wrong word um, to understand the treatments that you're going through or when you're trying to explain it to somebody else. Um, the understanding and relationship between structure and function as well as the connections of the rib cage um, anatomically and then also clinically applicably, um, all of those connections. Talking about how EDS is really more than just joints. Um, I'm sure that you've all heard that before, and the interconnectedness of everything, whether or not that's a real word, how everything is linked in the body together and how one area really will affect another, which is why posture is not something I can talk about without talking to a specific person because one area of your body is going to completely affect the postural relationship to something else in your body. So I can't make a generalized statement about it to one person and then have somebody else kind of take that information for themselves. Um, so the story that started this lecture, one of my um, patients came to me one day and they were complaining about rib pain and their shoulder pain. And they kept complaining about this shoulder pain. My shoulder's out, my shoulder's out, and I just can't make it go away. I don't know what to do. And one of the first things that the, I noticed was um, their their bra didn't fit correctly. And they were – it was – really pulling on them the wrong way. So they said, well, why don't we just fix this one thing? It's really bothering me. Can we fix this first? So I made, I, you know, helped this patient make some gentle suggestions, and we altered the way that the bra that they were wearing fit them. And 90% of the pain that they were having went away with just some simple adaptations to the, you know, sizing and the strap length and things like that. Um, and then just like everything else in the EDS community, that story spread like wildfire, and then it became, well, Trish knows all about this, so every patient came in with questions. So I have given this lecture before, and I will now be adding more of that because that became a very big uh, popular topic, and nobody else will seem to uh, address that, those issues for you. So if you have any questions on that, we'll address them today. Um, but PD, PT for EDS is really a big topic, and it's not something that I feel like I can answer for everybody because it, there's so many aspects of PT that you can't answer them specific to each person, and it's not going to be helpful. Because the one thing I hear from all patients, oh, and I get a lot of phone calls, because I would say 90% of the patients that I have have Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, and everybody calls in for advice from, you know, other states, and they say, I really, I just need to find a PT that knows all about EDS. I need to find an expert, and there's nobody in my area. And what I've started to tell everybody is you're not going to find one, um, so stop looking. It's very rare that you're in a situation like I am where my entire caseload is EDS, and if you had asked me 
five years ago all of the same questions, I wouldn't have known them because I get most of my answers from my patients and from the experience that I get. So what I usually tell people for the general guidelines of what you need to look for when choosing a physical therapist is you really want somewhere that you're going to find individual attention in the clinic and you're not going to go to a factory. You're not going to go to a place where you're being double, triple, quadruple booked. Um, you're going to want a physical therapist that's going to spend time with you and you want a person that's going to have a, an extensive knowledge of manual therapy. And I'll go over some of the words and what that really means because manual therapy does not equate to massage. There's a lot of misconceptions about what that really means. So you're going to want to ask in your PT before you get there, you know, do you know any of these things? Because if they don't, they're probably not the right fit for you. It doesn't mean that they're not a good therapist. There's lots of different avenues for physical therapy, and it might not be the right one for you. Um, the other general things is the the mantra of very low and slow. So with your exercises and with your program in general, your PT and you need to be on a low and slow program. There is no quick fix. You all, all know that by now. Um, it's You're going to want your exercises to be much lower than the average population. You're going to not be able to do as many of them the first time. You will build up that strength, and that's a good thing, but you need to figure out what your comfort level is going to be and then progress that slowly. So my advice to everybody typically is find somebody that you're comfortable with that's willing to learn with you on your journey together because if you don't have a physical therapist yet, you should probably find one because most patients with EDS end up in physical therapy at some point for either an injury or just generalized things that go wrong. Um, so you're going to want to find somebody that you like. And then the more that you see them, the more that you work with them, the more that they'll know about EDS and then they can be that expert for the next person that walks in the door. Um, and like I said, PT is a very specific to each person and each situation. There's different types of physical therapy for all different reasons. You could have, you know, an acute ankle sprain, and you're going to treat that differently than somebody that's just complaining of chronic low back pain. And I can't give you generalized guidelines of what to do and what not to do unless I know you as a patient. So the same thing is true. I want you to find a person that you feel comfortable with, and then they will learn. There's a lot of resources out there to help with this, and there's always going to be somebody to answer the question. You just need to be with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. You can't do it by yourself in many ways. Um, like I said, I practice um, quite heavily in manual therapy, so a lot of my patients, um, I utilize all of these techniques when they're appropriate, but when you go to look for a physical therapist, you want to ask them, do you know what these things are? And if they just say, um, yeah, I heard of it in school, that's probably not the best person for you. You really want somebody that's going to know um, joint mobilization and when to use it appropriately, because even though there's a lot of patients with hypermobility, there are instances when some type of joint mobilization may be appropriate. Um, you want to use muscle energy techniques. Um, myofascial release is a great technique that I use. Strain counter strain, cranial sacral therapy, and visceral mobilization. And one of the things that you'll find out there, too, is there's a lot of misconceptions within the PT world, within doctors, that if you give them some of these wor words without understanding them, they'll be like, oh, no, no, no. Like, they do that cranial sacral stuff. That's voodoo. Well, no, and I don't use that on every patient. I use it when it's appropriate for a specific technique. So somebody that has a wide breadth of knowledge on all of these things and knows how to incorporate them within a greater program because you can't just have somebody that does manual therapy on you and doesn't do anything else because that's not going to get you anywhere. You're going to need to incorporate that as part of a larger program. So we're going to go over posture in general. So I drew up this little diagram to kind of dictate what posture is. Um, if we think of posture, the easiest way to think of it for me is think of your body as a bunch of boxes. And everything is, should be in the right box. So the cranium here, up here, that's your head. That box is going to have your brain in it. And you want your brain to stay in that box. You do not want it dropping somewhere else. Your thorax, which is what we're going to focus on today, is your rib cage. Your rib cage, your mid back, and that's going to house your heart, your lungs, all some really important stuff. Um, and I say stuff in general because, like I said, postures are really complicated topic. So the more simple we kind of make things, the better. And then you have your abdomen box, which has most of your abdominal organs and your guts. And then you have all of these red things. These are what we call diaphragms in your body. Anything that runs horizontally across your body is a diaphragm. That's going to 
keep the boxes separate. So basically, it keeps the stuff in the right box so that they don't cross over. Because you don't want your heart and your lungs to end up in your stomach or in your abdomen. So that's why your diaphragm is really important. The same thing, you're, you don't want anything falling out of the bottom of your abdomen um, or your pelvis, so that's why you have a pelvic floor. And so these areas that are your, in red, your diaphragm areas are really important to keep in balance, to keep the stuff in the boxes where they belong, because when they don't, then things go kind of crazy. Another thing I tell patients all the time is that your body is built like a machine. So posture is the overall topic of how this all works together. So I'd like the graphic here where it shows this is what I see most of the time, and not just with patients with EDS. This is a general posture that we as people have. This comes from sitting too much. This comes from muscle imbalances. It comes from a lot of problems that we all have together, and it leads to a very specific subset of pain and postural issues and different kind of dysfunctions that contribute to why patients end up in physical therapy in the first place. And if one part of the machine is off, it's going to throw the rest of it off. And I like the way that this is depicted like a cog, like the cogs of a clock. And if one thing gets stuck or if one thing slips into the wrong cog, it's going to throw the next one off. And then that's going to be counterbalanced and throw the next one off. So this person on where I'm pointing out with my pointer on the left, is not exactly in the greatest of postures. I, I would like to ideally see them in this posture on the right. But in order to get there, you can't just push somebody and expect them to sit up straight. It doesn't happen like that. If you're in a bad posture because of a lot of reasons, you could be in pain, you could have something out of alignment that needs to be corrected in order to allow you to stack your cogs correctly and put your boxes in the right places to help hold you up. But then you need to figure out, how do I hold this steady? How do I keep it there? And that's where a lot of the strengthening and postural education and modifications will come into play. And that's why each one is different because these two people, they, these two diagrams, you can have multiple reasons why you would be in bad posture versus good posture. And it might not be the same each day. So knowing what the cause was will help you figure out how to fix it. Um, so I'd like this picture. By the way, all of my pictures came from Google image searching. I do not take credit for any of these. Um, this is a nice infographic where it shows a depiction of, you know, postural. Because I get a lot of questions, why do I have a headache? Well, there's a lot of reasons for headaches, and they're not all posture related. Some of them are medically related. Some of them are Chiari related. It's not always going to be the case, but oftentimes your posture really will affect how you relate to the world and how you could end up with a headache just from the bad posture. So if you look at this first picture, the weight of gravity is built to go directly through specific spinal curves in your body. So if your body is in a normal postural alignment, your body is built to support how heavy your head is based on the normal biomechanics. But as soon as your head starts to slip forward a little bit, you notice how it goes from 12 pounds to 32 pounds. So it's just sticking your head forward. Now that changes the curve in your back. It changes how much the muscles have to pull back here. And that's just from two inches. You bring it forward three inches, and now your head weighs about 42 pounds. And now this is pulling even harder. So all of these muscles are working even more. You're starting to get a lot of fatigue. And over time, you just can't sustain that. So then you end up in bad posture. Um, and you end up with a headache. And then you complain that you have a headache and nobody listens because, well, just sit up straight. Well, I can't anymore because now my body's stuck like that. So that brings me to, um, it's a very common, it's an osteopathic philosophy um, called the structure-function relationship. So the way that I've always learned it and the way that I tell my patients is that structure governs function and function influences structure. That's the big phrase. So the way, just like we looked at in the previous pictures, the way that your body is built will influence how you can function. If you look at that picture that we had up earlier where they were slumped forward, you can't raise your arms up over your head if you're sitting completely slouched forward. You need to be able to sit up straight. Just like with this, if you are all bent and crooked, you can't be hammered straight into a board. 
So just in the same way that your structure will influence your function, if you function in a bad posture, that will start to influence your structure. And when I say structure this way, it typically we'll be talking about your postural alignment or your alignment of your whole body in general. And malalignments in your body will lead to other dysfunctions down the road. Whether they lead to it the day that it happens or, you know, five years from now, it will have an effect. So understanding that, you know, sometimes I have patients stop doing their exercises because something's happened to change the structure at their shoulder, for example. And so I'll have them, well, stop doing these exercises because it's now going to start hurting your shoulder. So having that relationship with your physical therapist to say, all right, something's wrong, you can't, sometimes you can't exercise your way out of it. Sometimes you can. But you're not always going to know that yourself. So that's why you really want to, you know, work with somebody specifically when you're doing these things. But having that awareness in general is going to be crucial going forward as a overall understanding. So another patient um, gave me this example a long time ago as an analogy, and I've been using it, and I like the way that it, it comes across for everybody because it really does show all of my students and all my patients what all my patients go through and how, unfortunately, a lot of times things get misconstrued, and this, I think, gives a clearer picture and understanding of what you come into the clinic looking like versus what you come into the clinic saying. So when I look at a patient, and I'm sure you've all gone through this, you have your typical house will look like this. And then you have your house with the yes, and from the outside it looks like this. And they both look exactly the same. So nobody knows what to do with you. But as soon as they know that you have EDS, then, the, you know, a lot of times still, they won't help you. They won't touch you because they're afraid. Because a typical house is built with nice, strong, solid two-by-fours. And a house with EDS is built with two-by-fours that are riddled with termite damage. There's less of them. And the ones that they are using to build this house aren't structurally sound. They're, you know, there's some defective collagen, the soft tissues are weak, the connective tissues are weak. So you're already starting with the foundation blocks that are not strong. So when you build your house with these building materials, you tend to end up with this over time. And this is a lot of times what I see when patients walk into the clinic. They, they've they fallen over, they've broken down at their base and their house is falling down. And they're like, I don't know what to do. So you can't just stick some glue on it and slap it back together and expect it to stand up. You have to go back to the base and build it back up from there. So one of the things that I also educate patients on is fascia. So patients will come in and I'll, add, I'll give them lots of words because they come up when you guys read things. They come up when we, t when we talk about everything. And if we don't do a good job at educating um, our patients and our, our friends what we're really talking about, a lot of times things get misconstrued. So fascia is a really highly complex web of connective tissue, and I kind of explain it as the fabric that holds the whole body together. So if any of you are vegans, I apologize, but I always tell patients, if you think about fascia, it's that raw piece of chicken, and it's that white film that's on the outside. You peel it off, and it has this weird web-like structure. That's fascia. It's wrapping around everything in your body, and it connects everything from head to toe in one solid piece. Just like a sweater. If you pull on one edge of a sweater, you're going to have an effect on the other end because it's all woven from one piece of string. And there's three generalized categories of, of fascial tissue. You have your superficial fascia, which is actually what this looks like. It's a very spiderweb looking t tissue. Then you have your deep fascia, which is very strong, and it helps kind of create the boxes for our body. And then you have what we call visceral fascia, which is the connective tissue around all of our organs. And all of it can contribute to pain and dysfunction. And that's why having somebody that knows a lot about myofascial work, that's the area that you're going to, you know, need some help. So sometimes you do have areas where you get stiff and you get, you feel like you need to stretch. And a lot of times we don't want our patients stretching because it's going to stretch out those joints. Well, if you're working in different ranges, sometimes you need to stretch the fascial tissue that's tight because you're not stretching muscles. If you stretch a muscle, it's really tearing. You're stretching the fascial tightness around that muscle. And another one that I like to always point out to patients is the difference between a subluxation and a dislocation because those words are very often 
misused and used interchangeably. And that can be a dangerous situation for you and your physical therapist and your provider. Um, a subluxation is when a joint comes partially out of alignment, so less than 100%, and it stays like that. Or when a joint completely slips out and then it immediately re relocates by itself and it goes back into its normal neutral alignment. And a dislocation is when the joint completely and fully disrupts, it is a complete and full disrupt, disruption of the joint surface that's not immediately fixed by itself. And that can lead to a more severe and dangerous situation because there's nerves and blood vessels that can be damaged in that kind of a situation. And I find that a lot of times patients are using the word dislocation too frequently. Um, especially when you go back to your doctor and you're like, oh, I was with my physical therapist and they, they put my dislocated shoulder back in. Well, you really don't want to say things like that because that's not what physical therapists are allowed to do um, in many states. We all practice within our scope of practice, so you really want to be careful. Most often, what you're experiencing is a subluxation or an imbalance of the musculature or the joints or a postural imbalance, not a full dislocation. You very well may be, but you want to be cautious in when you're using those words and not overusing them because then when you do have it happen, it's, it's not taken as seriously. So a generalized, um, nice quick picture of the thorax here. Nice, uh, easy view. You have your ribs. Your thorax in general is your ribs with your thoracic vertebrae or your backbones. And then your sternum. And all of that connects together to make your rib cage, your thorax. And this is the box that we talked about that houses the heart and the lungs. And then that's going to connect to your abdomen box, which is your lumbar vertebrae supported. And then your cranium, which is supported by your neck. And I like to talk about ribs because I treat ribs a lot. And unfortunately, not a lot of physical therapists are experienced with treating ribs, but if you have EDS, I'm sure that all of you know, ribs are a big problem. Um, ribs are pretty important, and we don't give people enough credo for how important the ribs really are. They protect our vital organs. They provide attachment sites for muscles, and they really do move. People don't believe us, but they do. Uh, and they also influence breathing, and breathing is a really big deal. So ribs are really important to you as a patient. They're really important to me. So knowing how to treat them appropriately and how to help you with them really will influence your PT program in general. So the next couple of slides coming up are a lot of pictures, and I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the amount of anatomy in them. It's really there for you to appreciate. It's, I took out all the words because I don't want you to focus on what muscles I'm talking about because it doesn't matter. I just want you to be able to look at those pictures and kind of get a generalized sense of how complicated everything is, which is why I can't answer, well, how does posture make everything better or what muscle should I strengthen? It's very difficult to answer that without looking at each person individually. One really big one that's going to influence everything is the diaphragm. That's one of those things that we talked about that separates the boxes. So I want you to just take a take a look at the diaphragm. It's a dome-shaped muscle, which is really unusual for the body, and the middle here is white. So the mu the muscle is actually built differently than every other muscle in the body. It attaches on the outside, and then it attaches to one tendon in the middle, and it's a flipped-up dome shape. But it has these little extensions down into your lower back. So this is the breathing muscle that everybody talks about, and the only thing most people know how to do with it is teach you how to do diaphragmatic breathing to help you calm down. Well, that's not enough. It really does affect a lot more than that, and as we go through the slides, you're going to find that it's pretty impressive. So the diaphragm is shaped like a parachute, and it co it covers the top of your abdomen, and it connects to quite a lot of your organs, and it connects to your rib cage and it connects to the organs that are in your thorax, and it influences the structure and the function of that whole area of your body. So when the diaphragm moves up and down, it affects our breathing pattern. It also affects the pressure on our heart and lungs and the pressure on our abdominal organs. And because of that, it, it really influences the function of those organs, and with EDS, you have a lot of complications with other issues, with gastroparesis and other comorbidities that affect those areas. So having good posture is going to influence those different areas as well. 
So when you breathe in, the diaphragm moves down. And when you breathe up, when you exhale, the diaphragm will release that pressure and move back up. And a lot of times, one of the best things that you're getting is a lot of fluid movement and pumping motion. And that's something that we don't get, get if, you're, uh, if your ribcage and your thorax is not functioning appropriately. So again, don't, over, don't be overwhelmed by all the anatomy. But these are just a few of the muscles that are attaching to the ribcage. And I want you to look at all the layers. So when you say that your shoulder hurts, there's no reason why I shouldn't believe you because your shoulder is directly connected to your rib cage. You may have a rib problem, but look at all of the different connections of the shoulder to the rib. It might not be the shoulder that's causing you the problem. It might be something else, but there is a direct relationship from one to the other. Same thing in your head. You might have a pain in this muscle here, but working on this muscle alone isn't going to solve it. It might be coming from something way down here in your back because it's all connected. So again, this is a nice picture that shows the different layers on both sides of the body. These are all muscles that are connected to your rib cage, your thorax, and they are all postural muscles. So I can't answer the question, well, which muscles should I make stronger? Because they all have to work together. They all have a different function, and they all need to function appropriately in harmony together, and you need to train them in coordination in order for this miracle of posture it, to work pro properly for you, for you to function. And just like everything is connected, we need to recognize that things don't move by themselves, just like I said with the diaphragm. So this is another picture of the rib cage with the spine. This red part is the diaphragm, and then this underneath is your liver, just as an example. So this first one talks about the movement of the diaphragm. The, move, the diaphragm will move up and it will move down, but as that's happening, the ribs are also flipping and moving out and moving in, depending on the movement of the diaphragm. And then consequently, all the stuff in those boxes that we talked about, they're being influenced indirectly by the movement of the diaphragm and the rib cage. So the liver is moving, the stomach is moving, the lungs are moving. They're moving because of the way that your body is built to move. They're, not, they're moving by themselves. They're also moving as you move and every one of them has the potential to move the wrong way and cause you pain. So rib motions in general, this is very, you know, PT specific. A lot of PTs don't even know this, um, unfortunately. But the ribs, the top five ribs of your body move in what we call a pump handle motion. So just like this diagram shows, they move up and down. So when you breathe in, they swing up. And when you breathe out, they swing down. And then the lower ribs, will move in what we call a bucket motion. They'll flip up to the side and they'll flip down. And all of that is built in an amazing design to allow your rib cage to expand to let the air in and then allow it to come back out again. So any one of these ribs, you have 12 pairs of ribs. If one, one rib causes you an issue, it's going to start to affect the cascade of movement at every other level. And then you're going to end up with some kind of problem. And then it's probably going to cause you pain. And that's what you're going to come in complaining of. And you may not know why you're having that pain, but all you know is there's something wrong and I have to fix it. That's my job. You don't have to understand, and it's, it's good to know, but you, you don't have to know exactly what's going on. You need to have a physical therapist that's going to know that for you. So working with those and knowing those basic anatomy, you're, you can start to, I have all my patients do self-corrections for their ribs when they have rib problems because they've been able to be educated on how their ribs are moving and where they're feeling the pain and also how to correct that when it happens. And just like with the spine, I've heard it before, um, most often you're not coming in with a dislocated vertebrae. Um, what's happening is just like the just like the ribs move, the vertebrae move, but they're built to move in certain patterns. So when they're normally aligned, they're going to move on their joint surfaces. There's a way that they're built to move. But as soon as one thing gets kind of thrown off and cockeyed, it's going to cause a muscle spasm, and then that's going to move crooked. When that moves crooked, just like the cogs, it's going to throw the next one off and then the next one off. And unless they get realigned, either through your own correction of exercises or work with a physical therapist, it's going to start to cause a cascading effect down the line. So I want you to look at the really 
impressive correlation of the, this is the vertebrae, and then this is the rib. Look how closely they're related and how much space really does come in contact. These are the ligaments, which we know patients with EDS are always kind of lax and weak here because of the type of tissue that they're made up of. But even when you have a rib subluxation, you're not talking about an enormous amount of movement like you would be with the shoulder because there's not a lot of room for it to go anywhere. But even when you get it to slip a few millimeters, there's something that's going to, it's going to hit that's going to cause you a problem. And so just the slightest motion the wrong way, and it's going to cause an issue. So putting that back will also be a, slow, a slight motion. It won't be a big reduction. It's not going to usually pop back into place. Sometimes they slide in and they slide out. They're built to move that way, but it's when they get stuck out that you're having a problem. So I like this, the way that the uh, pictures on this slide depict things because we'll talk about rib subluxations. It's something I see pretty much every day with most of my patients. So the joint that I just previously showed you um, here, this is what we're talking about. So when you have a rib subluxation at this level, it's at the costovertebral junction. So that's where the rib and the vertebrae join up together. If you took a, take a look at the pictures over here, the yellow things are nerves. So this is a section of your nervous system called your autonomic nervous system. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but a lot of you have something called dysautonomia. And I'm sure that you know more than I do about it because most of my patients know a lot more than most of their doctors in many cases. So one thing I tend to see a lot is patients will have a correlation when they have rib pain or they have something happen. It can cause all these other funny symptoms that nobody really understands or can explain. But look at how close the ribs are to these autonomic nerves. So this nerve is lying right on top of this rib and Look at all the connective tissue there. So if this is weak and it hits this nerve, you're going to get some kind of problem. And that problem is what we call a somatovisceral dysfunction. Again, really big PT word. You don't need to know it. It's just it's, that's what it's called. I want it to be out there for your information. So dysautonomia in general is a blanket term for the malfunction of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is a division of your nervous system and it's divided into two parts. It's divided into your sympathetic divisions, which are your fight or flight reflexes, and then your parasympathetic divisions, which are your rest and digest reflexes. And if you look at where they are, so this is your brain, this would be your pelvis and your sacrum. This parasympathetic division over here, this is your cranial sacral system, which is why cranial sacral therapy can be so effective. But we're talking about the thorax today. So the sympathetic or your fight or flight reflexes, those reflexes that cause you to kind of stay on guard and be in pain and never be able to rest, those are housed in your rib cage in your low back. Anatomically, that's where they are. So when you have a problem at that level, it can cause that kind of a reaction. It can cause that fight or flight reflex. But the same thing can happen in reverse. If you're having a bad dysautonomia day, a bad POTS day, a bad gastroparesis day, and you have a problem at any one of the levels of organs, they can feed back into the body and give you pain at one of those levels because they're connected. So with the autonomic nervous system, everything can go haywire. Dysautonomia means something in the autonomic system has gone awry. And because it affects every system in the body, it's going to cause you a problem. And since EDS affects every system of the body, one can see how those two would be very much interlinked. And that connection is going to have an effect on your PT program. These aren't exercise things. And that's people, what most people think PT is all about. But this is a level that a lot of my patients will um, come in complaining of. And they not they can't do their exercises because they're stuck in this kind of reaction. So until we reduce their structure to improve this relationship, then they can go back and do their functions. But if they're stuck in a pattern of fight or flight and pain, they can't get through that sometimes. So getting people to get to that level can really be helpful. So this is just a little general overview of why it works. So this red thing over here is anything in the body. We'll just call it a muscle. And this is a cross-section of the spinal cord. So when we're having a problem, 
hold on, something's not working. Yet. There we go. The section of your body will send the information into the spinal cord. That information is then processed and sent back out to your body. When there's some sort of injury or insult at that level, it sends more information in. It says, ow, I'm in pain. And then that sends more information out. And it says, well, you're in pain. You might as well get shorter because you're injured, so you should spasm and get tiny. And it does, and it says now I'm in more pain, and that cycle continues. Until you just your body ignores it altogether, sometimes it can say, I'm in a lot of pain, and it doesn't know what to do with that information, and it starts to send it to other places. So, for example, your heart could be also innervated by the same level as different muscles that we looked at earlier. So if those muscles aren't paying attention, then it says, all right, well, you're not paying attention. I'm going to give the information elsewhere. And then it starts to affect your heart rate, and it gives information to the organ levels. And that's where you get those different levels of dysfunction in different areas of the body that don't really seem connected but really truly are. And, again, this is another picture. So before we looked at just the thorax and the uh, autonomic system connected up at the rib cage level, it's also the lower back area. And I want you to see how closely connected all the low back vertebrae are and the pelvis with all of the muscles and these autonomic nerves. So everything is so closely related that it's it's very important to that you can't separate one from another and you can't address your posture as a whole and you can't address your physical therapy program as a whole unless you're looking at those relationships. And it's also important to keep keep track of the fact that it's not always joint pain. There's a lot of different types of referred pain in the body. As a physical therapist, we're going to treat physical therapy-related things, but sometimes you might go in and it's not coming from your body. It's not coming from a joint. It's not coming from a muscle because these are different patterns that overlap with other areas that it might be coming from something else, and it's important to be honest with your physical therapist or your different providers because those levels, those are different areas that you might be having a problem. You might need to be seen by somebody else, and PT might not be the answer for you. So... Don't always get mad when things aren't getting better when you're doing your exercises. Sometimes it might not be the answer. That's why it's really important to have a team approach. So most of my patients are very lucky. I have a very close relationship with all of their referring doctors, and I talk very frequently with most of them. So patients with EDS are very complicated. You see multiple different specialists. So it's important for those specialists to then communicate with each other because we each look at it from a different way. As a physical therapist, I'm going to deal with PT-related things. Everything is related, but I'm going to deal with it from a PT side of things. If I think that it's not appropriate, I'm going to refer you to somebody else. And the same thing, you only want to go to your pain specialist when you're having pain problems. You're not going to want to go to them when you're having PT problems. And you are a very key, important member of your team, and that's something that I really harp on. Because patients will come in the first day and they say, well, can you fix me? And I always say, no, I can't because I cannot fix you. I'm going to help you help yourself and I'm going to help you on your journey to improving your own body, but I can't fix you. I can help you, but you were, you have to put in the work yourself and we have to work together. So back to that funny story from the beginning which is where a lot of my questions were generated from the first time, and I see that the Q&A is getting large, so I will stop pretty soon for those questions. Just making some postural support changes can take you from this posture that we started with. If you look at it, this area here, we always, as female patients, there's not a lot of good postural supports that we tend to take advantage of. They're all out there. We just don't know how to use them. Because with some gentle adjustments to the ones that you have already or getting the correct one, you can take yourself from this posture into this posture very quickly. And that can alleviate a lot of your symptoms that you've been working on for a long time. So these are some general guidelines that I've discussed with patients in the past that have been kind of helpful from their feedback, so I'd like to pass them along. Um, the weight of your bra should typically be supported by the band, not the straps. And I get a lot of people that say, well, I can't do that because they get rib pain. However, if you keep the band tighter around the rib cage, you have less weight supported by the straps. 
So you have less chance that you're going to hike your shoulders up by your ears, and then those muscles that are up there that cramp up and give you headaches and back pain and neck pain, they're not going to spasm because you're, they're not holding your bra up anymore. The wider that you keep your straps, there's a greater weight distribution. So if you can get wider straps, that's going to help take the pressure off of that area, and you're going to have less pain and less stress on your body. Crossing the straps will also bring the pressure centralized and closer to the center of your body, which will take away some of the pressure that your body is holding up because it will take less energy and less effort for you to hold it up. Also with the different bras, there's different ways that you can get closures. There's the back closures, which are the standard typical ones, and they come in different sizes from, you know, two closures will be less supportive than something that has four clasps to close it. But also patients who have a hard time closing them because they can't reach that far, or when they do, something pops. So there's also front clasps. And that's going to be more impressive for somebody that can't reach back without kind of hurting their shoulder. And then there's zipper front closures. There's all different. If you look for something, there's something out there for everybody. Um, postural support bras are marketed and built for this specific region in this area. Um, I've had patients try a dozen of them. Some of them don't like them because they're too tight. Some of them don't like the fabric that they're made out of. It's really a personalized solution, but proper fitting is the key. There's more more things that we can go over um, as I'm going to start to answer your questions, but each person needs to find their solution and really find one that works best for you. But once you get one that works, you'll find that you're not in as much pain or you're not having as many problems as you were before. Um, just because it's it's helping support you in a good postural alignment. And then you can exercise and stabilize that alignment. But if you're constantly fighting yourself within your own support that you're putting on externally, you're never going to get to a place where you're comfortably supporting yourself internally with all those muscles and joints. So this is a funny picture that I found from a patient that uh, said that when they put their bra on, to reduce their back strain, they ended up dislocating four joints in the process. So I do understand that this is a very complicated situation, and like I said, it's very personalized, and it's going to be what works the best for you, and it, what works the best for you might not be what works for somebody else, and that's why it's a very personalized situation, and I would recommend for the postural support going to find somebody that will actually do a fitting for you, and surprisingly, most department stores actually have somebody on staff that will do that, but if not, ask your physical therapist for the biomechanics of it. They'll be able to help you. It's not a question that people want to ask, but when you do, it makes a big difference. So I noticed that there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to start to read some of those off now. Um, I'm very happy to answer all of your questions, and if you have more as I go through, please keep um, asking them. So the first question here says, will bad posture cause scoliosis? I have scoliosis in my neck, and it's always been painful to try and bring my head back and straighten up my neck. Um, yes and no. So scoliosis can be caused from more than one reason. Um, there's two different types of scoliosis in general. There can be what we call a functional scoliosis and a structural scoliosis. So sometimes the scoliosis is something that is innate in your structure. It's within the alignment of your bones, and you either have it from something that happens, and that is it, when you move around, when you bend, when you it, – it will stay there, versus a, what we call a functional scoliosis, which is what I see in the clinic quite often. When you have an area that you're having pain, you tend to lean towards that side, and then over time, the muscles will become imbalanced, and you'll end up with – stress there, but your body is not going to allow you to hold yourself like that, so it's going to start to curve the other way because it knows that you're not in the right alignment. So what I, from what I gather on that question, bringing your head back to try to straighten up your neck, that means to me that that's the right exercise to correct something like that, but that goes back to our structure and function relationship. There might be something out of alignment that you need help correcting that's blocking you from doing the exercise to help strengthen and stabilize. Um, there are, I see that quite often, and there, it says here, are there techniques that you use with patients that are similar to what 
um, you would have for that situation? And I would say yes. So all of those manual therapy techniques, if you find a physical therapist that can help you with those techniques, there may be a structural reason why you're having bad posture and scoliosis, and then you'll be able to start doing the stabilization exercises to work with that to then improve your posture and take away that scoliosis. But it's going to depend on why it was there to begin with. Um, our next question says, are there different techniques that you use with patients with EDS that you would use with a patient with a Marfan or related connective tissue issues? I would say yes. So I tend to not look at my patients with EDS anymore as just patients with EDS. They're all, everybody with a connective tissue issue comes with their own set of situations because not every patient with EDS is the same. And patients with Marfans are going to be very similar in many ways to patients with EDS because they're going to come with a set of connective tissue issues, but also that very slow and low mantra that I go through. You're going to be tired a lot, and that comes with a lot of dysautonomia. So a lot of my patients that have come in with Marfans, we work on the same types of exercises for stabilization and joint protection and joint preservation, but also knowing that you're going to have to go much slower and they're going to need more time to recover. So I don't give patients very many exercises to work hard and to work for a long period of time. It takes patients a long time to make those progressions. Um, our next question is about a shoulder. Um, it says, my left shoulder is constantly rolling forward and painful. Um, any suggestions? Again. There, there might be a reason for it. Uh, it's not my patient, and it's hard to answer the, the specific question like that, but I'd rather use that as an example. So the reason that sometimes the shoulder can go forward, the shoulder is directly connected to the this, this shoulder blade or the scapula, and that can be forward causing pain if the whole arm is sliding forward. That can happen for a few reasons. If you're bent forward in a bad posture through your rib cage and you're slouching forward, that's going to throw your whole shoulder blade complex forward, which is going to cause pinching in the front of your shoulder. So a lot of times the shoulder becomes where you get the pain and where you get the symptoms. So that's what people try to treat. But I often say, look closer. It might be a problem with the ribs or with the rib cage or the spine at that level. And that if you're having a stiffness there, something else is going to move a little bit more to make up for that stiffness. So if you're bent forward and having a stiffness problem or a rib cage problem at that level, the shoulder is going to be where you're beating yourself up and getting the pain. So if you're just treating the shoulder, you're not really treating the cause of it. So I would, if you're doing a treatment that's not helping you, I would say go back and relook at the situation and what is the root cause of what, what's happening? Is it really a shoulder problem or is it something else? And if it is and that situation still not, then you may need to reevaluate what you're doing to help stabilize that joint. The next question down says, can scoliosis without rib subluxation ever cause vertebrae presets to lock closed? Absolutely. Um, so ribs don't have to be involved in order for the vertebrae facets to lock close. Vertebrae facets lock closed all the time on patients with EDS and without EDS. I would say I would spend more than half of my day dealing with this. It's what causes most back pain. Um, mechanical dysfunctions of the spine cause and trigger spasms, which then cause issues with posture, issues with pain, and those facets being locked up can cause stiffness, and that's where things with EDS get a little complicated. So the facets lock up, and the facets are the joints on the, sp on the side of the spine, for those of you who don't know. It was one of the pictures I had up earlier. The facets can lock up, and then that can cause the pain in the spine to happen, and that area gets stiff. And the, the longer that goes untreated, the longer you can end up with compensations elsewhere. But you can definitely do – oh, I lost my question. You can definitely do um, manual therapy treatments to help correct that, as well as um, stabilization exercises. Once it is corrected, you need to then do some good core stability exercises around that vertebral level to help hold it in place.
Uh, sorry, lots of questions. Do you have any recommendations to treat costochondritis? Um, not in general. It would be a patient-specific thing. I have had patients with costochondritis. If you can reduce the – costochondritis happens when you get an irritation or inflammation at the joint surfaces where the ribs and the sternum meet. If you can reduce the other areas um, the, that are causing and contributing to those problems, that can sometimes help, but there's a lot of reasons why you get costochondritis, so I would have to – defer that to why are you getting it, and I would ask the person to probably ask their physical therapist or their provider what's causing that costochondritis issue for them at that time. Um, there's a question here. Can physical therapy help break up scar tissue and adhesions, and are scar tissue and adhesions different in patients with EDS? Yes. Physical therapy absolutely helps with scar tissue and adhesions. It's one of the main things that we do um, across the board for all patients. And scar tissue and adhesions are different in patients with EDS only because of the way that we typically treat them. So when people think of scar tissue, they think of really thick tissue after surgery. And in most cases, patients need that broken up because it causes things to stop moving. And adhesions, the same thing. With patients with EDS, I'm very cautious when I do this. I do it because I have a lot of experience in manual therapy in dealing with those adhesions. And the adhesions come from the level of the fascial tissue that we talked about earlier. But knowing that sometimes when you have that scarring and the, the muscle spasm, excuse me, hiccups, the scarring and the, and the adhesions, sometimes that's actually contributing to stability. So you want to be very cautious in letting anybody um, just massage and break up that scar tissue without looking at the structure as a whole around it because if you do, you can then contribute to some instability at that level as well. So physical therapy is going to be one of the best things for you to to work on that scar tissue, but I would be very cautious and I would only let a physical therapist who had extensive manual therapy knowledge or has been working with you and your body for a long time to know whether that's an appropriate treatment for you at that time. The next question says, do you have any suggestions to help with posture when working on the computer? For example, visualizations that would be more aware of our posture and ergonomic suggestions? Absolutely. So one of the best things I would recommend for that kind of a situation is actually the Internet. The Internet is full of great ergonomic solutions, um, and oftentimes you can find better pictures there than you can in most medical books. You want to keep your body in its most natural and neutral alignment when you're working on the computer. So when you're looking at the computer, you want the monitor to be at your eyesight because if you're looking up or you're looking down, that's going to make you start bending and extending your head which is then going to start to cause strain through your neck and then cause a cascading effect. So you want your visual field or where you're looking at the, the monitor to be straight. You also then want your mouth to be at a comfortable level where you're, it's resting and supported on the table and you don't want to be reaching for it. You don't want to be reaching up or down. And you want your shoulder and your arm, specifically in patients with EDS, to be supported. So the best thing really would be to have a chair with arms that you can – and have an elbow support for so that you're not straining to hold your arm up while using the mouse. Um, you also want to make sure that when you're sitting in your chair, you're sitting with your feet firmly planted on the ground at a 90-degree angle um, so that your hips and knees are also at 90-degree angles because if you're sitting in a chair that doesn't line up properly, it's going to throw your posture off. So you want your computer to be lined up so that you're sitting in an, what we call a 90-90 and then looking in your spine being straight, wherever that is, and then adjusting all of your other monitors and things on your computer station to be around that. And one of the other things that I recommend for patients is actually to take their chair away altogether and sit on a physio ball. If that's an appropriate level of exercise for you, you have the balance to do that. Um, that will help you work on that core stability all day as well as make it a better, area, a better uh, solution for your chair. The next question says, can physical therapy help with tethered spinal cord? Yes. Um, I see quite a few patients with a tethered, with tethered spinal cord issues. 
Um, I see them both preoperatively and postoperatively. I deal with um, Dr. Quinga actually gave one of the previous lectures, and I see her patients all the time. We have a really great relationship. I talk to her quite often about things like this. Um, so with patients with, with a tethered spinal cord, those are going to affect your symptoms preoperatively, and you want to be able to try and work with your body to stabilize, but you also want to have that relationship with the with the doctor to know when it's an appropriate time to make that referral and whether or not surgery is warranted. I also will see those patients then after the tethered cord release um, because there'll be, and just like with any surgery, a lot, of instabil a lot of instability and weakness around your core, also a lot of pain and um, generalized things that you need to get back. So after having nerve involvement in the spinal cord and then in the legs, you're going to need to really work on not just your strength, but also your balance and your coordination and what we call your proprioception or your ability to figure out where you are in space because all of that gets thrown off when you have an issue with the tethered spinal cord or any sort of nerve compression. And they all, all go back to the interconnectedness of everything, so you can't address one without the other. I'm getting a lot of questions from multiple it people asking for specifics on if I know specific PTs in different areas, and they're kind of all around the country, so I can't answer a lot of those. Um, I do have contacts. Um, my number will be available. If you want to call later and ask those questions, I can try and follow up with you, but the, your, your questions are jumping all around the on the map here as far as contact areas. I'm located in Rhode Island, so I see patients pretty much from the entire Northeast. Um, but I do have a few contacts for patients that I've made to reach out to other areas. Um, and again, a lot of times it's not a patient, not a physical therapist that knows a lot about EDS. A lot of times it's somebody that they knew back home that I've worked with and said, hey, these are things and if you need help, call me and we'll, we'll talk. And that's the best thing that you want to do is find that physical therapist that you're comfortable with in your area and then use your network of patients in your area to say who do you work with and what do you like about them. Um, but I don't have a lot of names to throw out there right now. But if you have a specific question, my information um, is up there and you can always feel free to call the clinic and uh, I'll get back to you on specific answers. What's your opinion about posture straps that can be purchased at pharmacies and worn behind the back, looped over each arm? Um, I tend to find I'm up for anything. A lot of times, some of the greatest solutions for my patients have been those as seen on TV ads, um, or something as simple as when I was talking about the crisscross straps and the racer backs. If you take a piece of string and tie your straps together on a regular bra, that's one of the most effective ways to create your own crisscross strap, and it's cheap. I wouldn't go out and buy a lot of expensive postural support solutions until you've kind of tried them and figured out what works, but I have had patients wear those posture straps that you wear behind your back over each arm. Some like them. They do tend to cause a little bit, bit of excess strain on the shoulder joint, so if you're having shoulder problems, I would consult your physical therapist before using them. But my general rule of thumb for every situation is if it hurts, don't do it. So if it's causing you an issue, then don't do it. Um, but I'm willing to try almost anything um, if it's going to work and if it's safe. It says, my next question says, I have a lot of problems with my SI joint slipping. Any advice? Um, absolutely. I would say my advice, you want to find yourself a really good physical therapist. There's a lot of... Um, things that can be done for this area, but also there's a lot of exercises out there to stabilize the SI joint and the pelvis, and that's going to be your foundation of your body, your posture and your body as a whole. There's very specific exercises that I work with that are built and geared towards stabilizing. I know that um, there's other exercise protocols out there. They're wonderful. There's exercises for a lot of patients with SI joints that don't have EDS, and those are also great. Just be aware that when you do them, you're not going to do as many exercises or as length of time. But the same general concept is there. You really want to look at stabilizing and strengthening the pelvic floor, the lower abdominal muscles, and the low back muscles. 
Um, the stronger that you make your hips and your pelvis muscles and all the attachments there, the more that you're going to help correct that stability of the SI joint. But you're going to need your SI joint to also be addressed and looked at to make sure that it's in a good alignment because if you're causing yourself pain doing those exercises, you're probably not doing yourself any justice. Um, can you give examples of techniques that might be involved in manual therapy? Are there subsets of manual therapy, such as muscle energy, that are particularly helpful for patients with EDS? What might they be, and what potential questions should I ask my PT to assess their knowledge of EDS? I would actually call any clinic or your physical therapist and ask them, those, those categories are the subsets that I gave you earlier. If, if they know what those words mean, they should have a general working knowledge of those different techniques. If, if it's something that they've heard of in passing and they're not well-versed in it, I wouldn't go to that person for that technique. They really need to be using them and utilizing those different types of techniques, such as muscle energy, every day. If it's something that they don't use every day and they're only using once or twice, I wouldn't let you be the guinea pig for that. I would want somebody that knows how to use it and how to use it appropriately because you're going to need to modify it a lot of times for you as the patient with EDS, I modify the textbook technique every day because a lot of my patients, the, some of the techniques have you in positions that are compromising to other joints, and I can't put them in the standard position, but I know the, I know the mechanics and the principles behind them so well because that's what I do that a lot of times I can achieve the same result by putting the patient in a different position, asking for you know, a muscle contraction to help realign those joints and then getting the same result but not compromising the other areas of structure that you would if you just went by the book. And it's, this one's a little bit specific, but I want to address it because I'm sure some of you have been in this situation before. It says that this person was diagnosed with a spondylolisthesis, which is when the lumbar vertebrae, or any vertebrae really, um, slips forward out of alignment, kind of like Jenga blocks that gets pushed forward. Um, and then they're starting PT next week. Is there anything specific I need to tell the therapist that they need to know about my EDS before I begin therapy? Absolutely. I would make sure that they know what kind of EDS you have. Um, it doesn't say here. But when you have a spondylolisthesis, you automatically have an unstable spine whether you have EDS or not. That gives you an, an instability in the spine. So that's what they should be working on is helping you reduce that instability with very small targeted corrective exercises to create the stability in the pelvis and the spine. Um, knowing that you have EDS, you are potentially going to be at higher risk for more instability than just that spondylolisthesis and that you're going to be in a, probably a little bit more pain than the standard patient when they do those exercises and it's going to take a lot longer to correct them. I wouldn't have them do any sort of quick corrections for that area because that's going to cause you more pain and more problems. The next question says, can subluxations in the thoracic spine and rib area cause fleeting nerve pain? I have shooting pains and pins and needles in my chest, up my neck, and into my jaw. The question, the direct question to that answer, the direct answer to that question is yes. However, the second part of that question leads to my slide where it says it can be more than just nerve pain. Those symptoms there I would definitely discuss with your medical doctor because those can also be um, referred pain symptoms for other areas, and I would definitely want somebody to look at that. I can't answer that one without looking at you as a patient, but I would say, I would address that with your physician to see if that's maybe coming from another area of the body, um, more medically based versus physical therapy based, because that sounds like it could be a little bit of both. Um, I'm going to scroll back up and make sure I didn't miss any big questions. Um, it says here, another question about tethered cord. If someone has a pos possible tethered cord, are there steps and procedures that you follow to determine what can be done to help alleviate the pain? Um, yes. I, there's a very standard set 
and I would refer I would defer to the experts and such as the neurosurgeons and physicians in those areas that diagnose uh, tethered cord. Phys, um, physical therapists will help you get to that point, but they're not going to make a diagnosis of that. However, there are screening tools and protocols that you can follow to help rule that in or rule it out. But also, because the symptoms of tethered cord very closely mimic a lot of the mechanical problems that happen with just generalized low back pain, postural alignment issues, and weakness in general, um, eliminating those as possible cause or factors in your pain um, may help you drive you towards a diagnosis or away from a diagnosis of a tethered cord. Um, but again, having that team approach of working at that and addressing whether or not you need to have imaging studies done to rule that out, but also correcting anything that could be contributing to that those symptoms, which may be tethered cord related, but also may be something else, and narrowing down the field before you address it further. The next question says, how much exercise help with joint how much does exercise help with joint stabilization in a hypermobile patient? Um, I say would, I would have to say quite a lot. Exercise is going to be one of the primary areas that you're going to get your joint stabilization because in patients with EDS, the, the joints are inherently unstable because the connective tissue that holds them together is weak. So you need to rely then on all of the muscles and what we call your dynamic stabilizers. So the muscles are the ones that cause you to move. They're going to be your dynamic stabilization around a joint versus those static ligament stabilizers, which are weak. So you're going to need to strengthen those muscles to help protect that joint and help stabilize them. And when you get to those exercises, you really want to work on exercises that are stabilizing in nature and not movement in nature. So you want to work on things in what we call co-contractions and stability exercises. And like I said, there's a lot of exercise protocols out there. Um, there's a great book out there. Kevin Maldani wrote it. Um, and there's a whole protocol for all the different joints in the body. Your physical therapist should know those those basic principles and your exercise is going to be to focus on that joint stability. Don't focus on the kind of um, cookie cutter exercises that are out there. You really want to focus on stability exercises for yourself in good alignment um, and good safe posture. So if you're having problems standing up to do your exercises, there's ways that you can modify them to sit down or lie down um, to keep the rest of your joints more stable. Um, I think I got them all, but I'm going to scroll down one more time just to make sure. Again, I want to thank everybody that tuned in tonight, and I want to thank all my patients that gave me the information over time of coming up with this PowerPoint for you, and hopefully I answered everybody's questions and gave you a little bit of a different perspective on things. Thank you, Trish. Wonderful information that you've given to us all. And a good um, compliment to, you know, some of the other physical therapy topics that we've covered. Um, you know, you, you've just, just really provided more um, <laughs> more information for us to think about. Um, my gosh, um, all the um, structures that are in the thorax is just mind-boggling. <laughs> and um, so we, I think we covered all the questions, looks like it. Okay. Um, any last um, thoughts that you wanted to leave with us or um, any other information? I guess they can contact you for, um, through the um, website or the office number if they have any yep. more questions they haven't gotten a chance yeah. to ask. If there's any more, and feel free to, you know, email me questions. I will eventually get back to you. A lot of them, I had to skip some of the, you know, do you know people in certain areas because um, I'd just spent all night spouting off names that weren't really helpful, but contact me and I will try and get you information. If I don't know somebody, I might know somebody who does. Um, that's why it's good to have that network of people, but your best bet is to honestly ask your friends in your area who they like. Um, but any other questions, I'm more than happy to go over things. And if you want clarification information from um, – some of the things that I've said, if I didn't explain something well enough, please, please feel free. I'd rather you contact me and I'd answer your questions. Um, to clarify that, I don't want, you know, information being misconstrued and being frustrating. So. Okay, wonderful. 
And I um, wanted to remind everyone that Trish works in Rhode Island um, with Mike Healy. Um, Mike does have a webinar also on our website if you want to check that out. And, um, yeah, the person, somebody uh, here asked for contact information. We'll include that on the same uh, page that you logged into the meeting tonight, uh, where you will give a link to the recording. Um, so we'll add that to that page for you. You can go back uh, in the next couple of days to, to take a look. Okay. And I um, wanted to remind everyone that our next webinar is on February 16th, and we will be uh, listening to Dr. Grubb talk about POTS. Um, so continue to check on our uh, website on the webinars tab for uh, future uh, announcements. And you can also get onto our uh, email list if you'd like um, by clicking on uh, chronicpainpartners.com or edsawareness.com on the webinars page. And again, we wanted to um, thank Trish for all of her time and sharing her expertise tonight. Um, we're getting a lot of good feedback here from the live attendees, and, and we really appreciate you uh, doing this for us, Trish. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Yeah, thank you, Trish and Deanna. You both did very good, and Trish, that's very valuable information that will be out uh, available uh, on YouTube and also on our website. And I just want to remind people that uh, these programs are all free. Uh, please visit our store at bodysupportstore.com. Uh, basically, the proceeds from that uh, helps us uh, put on these programs and pay for our web fee. So, uh, again, thank you for all that joined, and we'll call it an evening. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.